Hello and welcome to my review and thoughts on 2005's A History of Violence. So, before I get into it, there is a link to donate to SAC AFTRA Strikers in the description box, as well as links to videos that help explain why this is such an important strike. So, please give all you can. And, yeah, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because that it's not that much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the graphic novel, so it sucks, whether you agree with those assessments or not, this is not that review. And... Yeah, I realize this video is long. I'm doing a can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review, most likely of the Zero Spoilers. If I do spoil anything, I'll verbally warn for I do so. Hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including for the graphic novel, and I will be discussing the ending in detail. So. This movie is rated R, and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I'm going to to quote the MPAA here. The movie has strong, brutal violence, graphic sexuality, nudity, language, and some drug use. So, yeah, this is, if, if, don't make this the first R-rated movie you've ever watched. And I might also swear some in this video. Now, so the, uh, yeah, the version of the movie that I'm going off for this video is the European Uncensored. I have never watched the American toned down version. And, yeah, so the, I first watched this when it came out. I, I'm pretty sure I even saw it in theaters, yeah. And I have watched it a couple of times since. I think this might be like my fourth or fifth viewing total. And I am recording this right after uh, finishing this most recent viewing. Now, the, the plot. So I'm going to quote IMDb. A mild-mannered man becomes a local hero through an act of violence, which sets off repercussions that will shake his family to its very core. And, yes, so the, this is based on the graphic novel by John Wagner and Vince Locke, and I am not really familiar with, you know, so let's see, yeah, they've written a couple of other things that have become, like, Yeah, the uh, John Wagner, you know, wrote Judge Dredd, which is you know he has a um, credit for creating characters on several of the you know several games, and um, let's see, he has one for the yeah for the for the 2012 dread for the 95 judge dread you know i i think he did a good job with judge dread and yeah vince Locke, don't know anything else that he is connected to now josh olson wrote the screenplay for this and in addition he wrote He's, yeah, he's written six other movies, uh, including Trigger Warning. I am not even going to try. There's a 2016. If I had to get it, it looks like maybe an Eastern European language title. Uh, he, yeah, he wrote the 2002 movie Infested, which he also directed. The 2001 Instinct to Kill, 99's Hitman's Run, and Hitman's Agenda. He also wrote the 2001 short Puppy Love, which he also directed, and 2000's A Moment of Silence. 
and he also has a couple of TV writing credits and, and such. Yeah, this is the only thing I've watched that he has written and uh, yeah, the, the the script is quite good, like you get a sense of each character, like maybe not not everyone right away, but like by the end of the movie, you have a pretty good sense of every major character, who they are, what their past is like, and that kind of thing. The movie handles plot twists uh, pretty well, and yeah, so this was directed by David Cronenberg, who I am quite a fan of. But yeah, before I get further into that, uh, so the yeah the characters in the movie are Hollywood pretty instead of small town plain, uh, which you know in the in the comic they are small town plain, and some people have criticized that in this movie they are Hollywood pretty. There is a reason I'll cover it in the spoiler section. And the movie works both as a modern western and a satire of it. It explores violence, both its causes and effects. Now, I've been a fan of Cronenberg since at least the early 2000s. I've watched everything by him that I've been able to get a copy of. So the, f the following is a ranking worst to best. Keeping in mind I love all of them. They're all amazing. I'm ranking how much I love them, not whether or not I love them all. Bro the Brood, The Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanners, Spider, Dangerous Method, Existence, The Fly, Videodrome. That's right. In my opinion, The Fly defeats the spider, not the other way around. And, right, I'm at the end of this review. I will let you know where this movie falls on that ranking. And like every Cronenberg film I've just mentioned having watched, this doesn't quite take place in the real world. Like some of them are more outrageous than others, but this, even this, you know, which is close to the real world, it's not quite the, the real world. Now, Cronenberg doesn't really want us to know if the characters are good or evil. He wants us to think about whether that, you know, and, and make up our own minds about it. And in an in interview, Cronenberg has said he feels there's comedy in all his movies, and he's happy with how funny they are, which, I mean, maybe it's just like Canadian comedy, you know, the, the I find Phalus to be very funny, but he, like, often does this, like, soft sell of, of jokes, like, acting like he doesn't really want to be doing it kind of thing, so. But this one definitely does make me chuckle. And Maria Bello says in interview that's on the DVD, Cronenberg scripts are lean. He wants the actors to feel it out themselves. And to be clear, she's saying that as a positive. And I think that might be... Yeah, so... A couple of... Yeah, before I start quoting critics and other reviews, I wanted to respond to a couple of common things. Some of the negative user reviews reveal they're just so used to watching bad superficial movies that they don't recognize depth when they see it. Like, you're allowed to hate this movie. If you think this movie is the worst thing ever made, that's fine. But saying that there's no depth to it is just completely ridiculous. I 100% disagree with those who say this was a mercenary job for Cronenberg. I think they're just so used to ridiculous revenge stories. They didn't realize this one was ridiculous to satirize, similar, you know, that similar to how a number of people misunderstood that aspect of Starship Troopers. Now, uh, yeah, so some some quotes from reviews. Violence is a huge part of America's history and culture. Thus, the relationship between the average American and violence should be explored. The acting was awkward. I that I that is one of the few criticisms of this that I will. There's there's definitely some awkward acting. This you know Cronenberg. I love his work. He is not the best actor's director. At least not always. You know, and yeah, I mentioned you know Maria Bello points out the the scripts are lean. He wants the actors to feel things out. I'm not sure the actors cast. I don't know if this is down to Cronenberg himself or the the casting director uh, let's see Deirdre Bowen 
but I think an argument could be made that at least some of the, maybe especially the younger cast in this, they're just, they're not entirely ready to, to they, they need a little more guidance, counselor. Uh, let's see, um, yeah, minimalist, uh, yeah, some say it's too cliched, which, you know, I would argue that it's always investigating these cliches. And, yeah, I, something I saw several people say, it is supposed to show normal people, Cronenberg has lost his touch, forgotten what normal people are like, and the movie suffers for it. I'm not sure I completely agree. I think it is the, the yeah, there's, they're not supposed to be completely normal people, they're supposed to be something else that they are. And, right, one person says, the plot is predictable, it's a story we've seen before. I mean, it's not the plot that's supposed to be compelling, it's the themes, it's the way the characters behave in the certain situations. Right, and, and one person said, I'm sure critics would analyze this movie, but I, as a regular viewer, did not enjoy it. You're entitled to your opinion, but I have no idea why anyone would go to a Cronenberg movie and not try to analyze it. And some user reviews were positively giddy at expressing this opinion, just like so eager to tell the world. Just like there's a, there's so many movies out there. If you don't want to analyze, you know, especially if like I will acknowledge the trailer doesn't really tell us that it's deep. I can imagine a lot of people watch the trailer and went to it just expecting a straightforward revenge story and were frustrated with that and I get, you know, that is, you know, I can understand that frustration. I've been frustrated by movies that I thought was going to be one thing and were another or just it felt like it didn't quite live up to expectations or something but to just proudly declare to the internet I refuse to think about the movies I watch just in a, in, a, in a review of a David Cronenberg movie, I don't think I wouldn't. Let's go with that. And, right, one person said, the violence is brutal, so it must be supposed to be appealing to people who want to see that kind of thing. I completely disagree. It's supposed to be off-putting. That's why it's so detailed and gross. And, uh, yeah, all Cronenberg films are about identity. And, yeah, the opening of this movie does a really great job. Um, we meet some bad people, and then we meet the very well-adjusted, happy family of the, the stalls. And the contrast is very, very compelling there. And... Just the, like the movie immediately sets up. This is going to feature a conflict between these very, very bad people and then these at least seemingly normal people in a, in a small town. And I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I think it's absolutely perfect. And... So I don't want to, I'm not going to go into spoilers about the original work. I do think that it's good. I, in, in my opinion, the, the, in my opinion, every single change, and there's some very significant ones, in my opinion, they're always for the, for the better. And... You know, it's this is one of those where, like, because graphic novels are allowed to be longer than movies, like, a chunk of the graphic novel is adapted, but an, another chunk is, you know, pretty much ignored. And this is something that some fans of the original have been very uh, angered by, and... Again, you know, I'm I I've seen my share of bad adaptations, so I understand the frustration. 
I just, I don't think it's the kind of thing where, like, essentially it would have to be a miniseries for them to, or a multi-part movie, which, you know, for one thing, I don't know exactly where you'd really, where, where the cutoff would be that it wouldn't feel like one of these movies were just you know had a had a a lot of of action and the other it was mostly backstory that's one thing and another you know like yeah in in 2005 they weren't really doing two parters of these kinds of of things now, uh, yeah, that uh, brings us to the character. So Viggo Mortensen stars as Tom Stoll. And according to IMDb Trivia, Mortensen brought many props for the diner and the Stoll home from his trip in the American Midwest. This helped him get deeper into the character, e.g. fishing themed like the poster of fish types shown on the back wall opposite the counter. And yeah, that's... That's really great, and then in you know on the on the DVD, um, Cronenberg says, "Never had an actor do that before," but yeah, that's that's Mortensen, and yeah, Mortensen praised the film as one of the best movies he's ever been in, if not the best. Also declaring it was perfect film noir, close to perfect. And, uh, yeah, in a 2014 interview, Mortensen said he read Josh Olsen's original version of the script and was quite disappointed. It was 120-odd pages of just mayhem, kind of senseless, really. He only agreed to do the movie after meeting with Cronenberg, who, according to Mortensen, reworked the script. And, yeah, I 100% agreed. I agree that, the you know, if, if, the, if the original script was much closer to the original graphic novel yeah I don't I don't think it would have been anywhere near as interesting as the movie that we ended up with and uh, right and and the you know the thing with you know oh the you know small town people are not you know that pretty you know let's keep in mind Cronenberg is plenty comfortable putting people who don't fit current beauty standards in lead roles you know just look at some of his early work so it's not that there is a reason for it and again like it you don't have to like it but it frustrates me to see a number of reviewers who don't even seem to consider that there might be a reason for it just yeah reject it out of hand and let's see Okay, so, yeah, the following I don't think makes any sense, but, you know, some viewers felt this way. So, one person said, Vigo is very good, very good in the lead role. That is true. This is far from an Oscar-worthy performance. I'm getting a little tired of how much he underplays these characters. For Aragon the Lord of the Rings, an underplaying is an inspired choice, but here I can help but feel there was more to bring to the character if he just dialed up the energy a bit. I think that is a fundamental misunderstanding of the character, and I don't say that lightly. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. Yes, I'll. You know, I'll. I'll. When I talk about the spoilers, you know, I'll. I'll. If I remember, I'll try to address this directly. I guess I could just briefly. Certainly, I'll I'll try to make it clear before the end of the spoiler section why I think that choice was made, and I do appreciate that this this girl this this person does acknowledge that it is a choice. And let's see, right, and, and Viggo Mortensen made this not long after the Lord of the Rings trilogy where he intentionally dirtied himself up because it fit that character. So, yeah, it's very, it's quite the, the contrast to see him so literally clean. 
Maria Bello plays his wife Edie Stoll, and I I quite appreciate she's a very her character is strong, you know, and I know some people scream at the thought of a strong female character, but just the, the you know, she's very determined to protect the family. And, uh, yeah, the, the writing and acting make perfect sense. Ed Harris plays Carl Fogarty, and he's just amazing um just yeah you know Ed, yeah ed harris usually amazing i don't know if i want to give too much away i'll just say there's a there's a somewhat mysterious aspect to his character and he plays it exactly right like yeah it's not a spoiler to say like one of his eyes is like has has been injured and he has this scar across the cheek and like right away you gotta know what's what what happened you know that's it, it really draws the eye and Ed Harris you know like the makeup effects are great and that's of course part of what makes that work but he also just plays it like we gotta remember he literally he he sat in the the makeup chair they applied that and he you know like nobody actually cut his his cheek you know but he completely sells it like you you get the sense that he's been you know he's had this scar for a while now and it really fires him up like he hates the 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 person that did this to him and just you know he's not like screaming he's not over the top there's this there's this underlying sense of intimidation he's he's very soft spoken and you know like if you didn't know better you might even think he was nice like he comes to this diner and you know he's like he's not really ordering any food, so Tom is like I'm I'm sorry, but you, I'm gonna have to ask you to to leave. The, you know I have paying customers, someone might need your seat, and he like whips out I I forget I think it might be a hundred dollar bill. It's like I think now I qualify as a paying customer. You know and, and Tom's like, I I can't take that, and he's like no no go ahead take it. You know kind of so so just he knows he's in control. And it's wonderful to see. Just he's he's so much more compelling than like a, a shouty bad guy would usually be. William Hurt, R.I.P., plays Richie, and I really don't want to give too much away about. I'll just say it's a it's another great performance. You know, just, it's William Hurt. Of course, it's an amazing performance. Ashton Holmes plays Jack Stahl. He is the the son of Tom and he's basically like he's maybe no not the most popular at at school you know the relationship between Jack and Tom is fine you know they they're not like screaming at each other there's a little bit of passive aggressive you know he's he's a teenage boy so it's not it, it's not it doesn't feel like a a really big thing at school you know he tries to not get in fights and such and there is a yeah he has there there's an intelligence to the character that I you know quite appreciate there's a lot of teen boys in American media that are just kind of you know not very intelligent and the the character is much better I'm, I'm not saying every character has to be intelligent and I'm not saying, you know, definitely nobody should be treated worse for being at least perceived to be less intelligent. But the fact that this character is intelligent really adds to the movie. He has some choice words for certain characters that, you know, in addition to being like conflict, which is of course good for, for movies, like he's he's making good points. 
Peter McNeil plays Sheriff Sam Carney, and he's also really great. There's this, you can really tell that he, like, he's on a first-name basis with the Stahl family, and, you know, he comes in, like, at one point, Edie, because she feels threatened, calls Sam, and, you know, he comes to their home, he sits on the couch, and she's like, do you, do you want some pie? You know, just, like, it's completely clear that they have a personal relationship. It's not just, you know, oh, there's trouble, call the cops kind of thing. They, they actually do know each other and are, you know, have a positive relationship. Stephen McHaddy plays Leland Jones. Again, uh, broken record, Stephen McHaddy, amazing performance. You know, the... the he doesn't have as much screen time as you you might you know it would be great if he had more screen time but for what he has he makes a very powerful expert in impression and again he's not necessarily shouting there's this very quiet intensity to him where like the moment you see him you could tell there's something there's something wrong here this is not okay kind of and just yeah, like a lot of the time he, he barely raises his voice. He's just calmly, you know, talking about things. Sometimes he does raise his voice, and then you know this is not going to go well. You know, shit's about to go down, because we know what he's capable of when he's not raising his voice. So just really, really great choice. Greg Brick plays Billy Orser, who also, like, not a huge amount of screen time, really, really great for the, the, yeah. And, uh, yeah, with him there's also this kind of quiet intensity. Kyle Schmid plays Bobby, who bullies Jack. Sumela K plays Judy, a friend of Jack. And if you think you recognize her, she played Kitty Pride for maybe 40 seconds in X-Men 1. I got him, you know, the moment I saw her, I was like, I know that face. And, you know, had to look it up. Yeah, that's, that's her. You know, she says, bye, professor, and goes through a door. With her mutant powers, not like breaking the door. And uh, Jerry Quigley plays Mick. Deborah Drakeford plays Charlotte. Uh, See, and they they work at the the diner with Tom and just very pleasant small town people kind of thing. And Heidi Hayes plays Sarah Stahl, and one of the first scenes is she had a nightmare, and even Jack helps soothe her when she you know like you could there's so many movies there's so many characters so many real people who would be like. I have school tomorrow. You're waking me up in the middle of the night because you think there's monsters. Really? But he's like super sweet and like, you know, the, like she's talking about monsters and he's like, you know, he knows there are no monsters or, you know, not the kind she's having nightmares about. That's the, you know, it's, it's really excellent that literally the first thing we see the Stahl family talk about, you know, they're like the, the daughter, uh, you know, she's, I don't know, seven maybe, uh, you know, she had a nightmare because she thinks there's, I forget if it's under the bed or in the closet, something like that, you know, the, the classic kind of thing, you know, and the family, not, they don't all say the same thing, but all of them try to convey to her she is not threatened by these monsters, you know, some of them say monsters aren't real, you know, Jack says, you know, if you if you close, well, let's, right, if you if you turn on the the light, they won't hurt you because they're scared of light. Which you know, like hopefully, not talking about like the actual light, just the night light. But yeah, you know, that's a good you know, if you if you can manage to get a kid to believe that, that's a great way to help them go back to sleep. You know, and she does also, you know, she does. That, that's the great thing, you know, several, at least one of them, they, yeah, several of them try to talk her out of being afraid, and one of them says the monsters don't even exist. She still says she'd prefer the nightlight on, so 
on some level, she has maybe a sense that mm, monsters are real. I need to do what I can to protect myself from them. And of course, not long after, yeah, this small town is in fact attacked by monsters. Just not the kind that hide in the closet or under the bed. Human monsters. Let's see, Aiden Devine plays Charlie Rourke. I believe he also works at the diner. And let's see. Yeah. Um yeah, uh, um the 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 bully is very stereotypical, um, but he is also convincing enough, you know, he uses the F slur, he's trying to provoke a, a fight because he knows he'll win, you know, very, very, and, and there's like, there's one slight that he keeps bringing up. He keeps being angry at this, at, at Jack for one thing that he thinks Jack did wrong. So, yeah, stereotypical, but there's also some truth to it, sadly. I don't want to spend too long talking about the the acting of, of Heidi Hayes, who plays Sarah. Um, I've said before, I basically, I don't think that we should have child actors, you know, the... the yeah, she was she was in nine she had, she has nine credits as as actress. The last one was in two thousand seven. Um IMDB doesn't say anything about what she does these days, but yeah. I don't think anybody who's not at least eighteen should be acting unlike that you know, if you're acting like you know, school plays, that's fine. You know, I did that. That you know doesn't screw you up for life. But being, like, famous for acting can really, like, a child, like, literally, the brain is not done developing. That's not good for, you know, it's going to it's gonna completely screw up your, you know, there, there's a few that have, that have escaped it. But, like, you look, there's a lot who haven't been able to, you know, and, and some do, like, some have had a career since they became adults, since, you know, but yeah, a lot of them were treated really badly, you know, suffered trauma. I acknowledge that it would be really awkward if, like, each time we needed a child character, we had an adult play them. Like, I agree that it's awkward when 30-somethings play 17-year-olds, but I really don't think that we should be asking anyone under the age of 18 to act in like a big movie kind of thing you know if you want yeah if you want to do it in like a home movie sure you know again did that myself turned out I mean I would say fine but you, you know you can you can decide that for yourself she's not particularly good and I don't blame her I you know again in part Cronenberg is not the best actor's director, and also just, you know, some of the scenes that she has to act in, like, it's clear that they didn't want the child actor to be scared. And that's, you know, I think that's, that's, I would rather that she not be scared than she was scared and it improved the acting or something, you know. But, yeah, like, there's time, like, there are times where she'll say something or do something, and, you know, the, the thing she says, it doesn't sound like she completely believes what, what she's saying. It, like, it's just, she's, she's reciting lines, basically. And the, yeah, when she, when she does something, it doesn't completely come across as, like, is she... You know, like, clearly, there's something she's, you know, she's thinking something. She's trying to accomplish something, but the audience, it doesn't come across that strongly to the audience. 
And one of these scenes is actually very important. Uh, you know, it's it's fairly late in the movie, and yeah, just the the scene suffers be because of it. But again, I really I do not blame Heidi Hayes. I I think she did the best she could. Now the right that brings us to the dialogue. So there are fifty two entries in the IMDb quote section. All of them are good, and let's see. yeah, the the cinematography was handled by Peter Sushitsky, who you know among a number of others. This is one of the many cases where Cronenberg, you know, uses the same. You know, he he has a tendency to to stick with the same cinematographer, editor, and and these. You know, he doesn't. It's not every single time the exact same one, but he tends to use the same person more than once. And for an auteur like Cronenberg, it's very clear that it's because he's happy with what they're giving. Like, sometimes you'll see, like, I don't know if I want to name names, but I would definitely say there have been times where I sat watching a Robert Rodriguez movie and someone popped up that I know Rodriguez has worked with elsewhere, and it felt like they like working together more than Rodriguez thinks that this is that that he, this is the best person for the job, the kind of thing. And yeah, the 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 camera work is is great. There's a lot of subtlety in it it doesn't necessarily call attention to itself and as a modern western you know it really captures the feel like when someone walks into the diner it feels like they're walking into a saloon you know there's various confrontations throughout the movie that really feel like they're ripped right out of a classic western and the camera work really really underlines that now, the editing was handled by Ronald Sanders, uh, again, worked with Cronenberg a number of other times. There's a couple of scenes where some where things happen very, very fast, and the editing manages to make it easy to follow, despite how fast it's going, and also, you know, create a great intensity because of this editing. And then there are a number of scenes where people are just talking you know it's small time small town life especially early on before the monsters you know at the very start it's just people living a nice comfortable small time life you know there's there's very little that really challenges that there's a little bit of weed smoke that you know certainly you know small town folk would insist that is not something that is that common but these scenes are much more casual you know the the which yeah and the yeah so the movie the, the yeah the the budget was 32 million and the box office was 61.4 I think I think in 2005 that was considered pretty good like today it's not it, it wouldn't be but at least not for like a big studio would, would not think it was good enough and uh, yeah this was filmed various places around Canada you know Canada made to look like this small town you know, and and yeah, mostly mostly Ontario, some in Toronto, but yeah, uh, some some location shooting, some studio stuff, and they do a great job blending them. You really can't tell where one ends and the next one begins. The the yeah, the location shooting really adds to it. There's it feels like. This is a place where people live, which can be much harder to do with a with a studio. And let's see. 
Yeah, and and the various sets like, you know, it it is set around this small town, and yeah, like early on, everything seems safe, at least for the time being. Like we have the sense that it's going to go, there's going to something bad is going to happen, but it feels like right now it's safe, and then once the the yeah, once bad things start happening, the the movie does a really great job making it feel like nowhere is really safe, you know, and it, it really does feel like an invasion, and, and, you know, these others coming into the town and making it dangerous, which is some, something that makes me really appreciate that the bad guys tend to be white. I, this would have been really, really ugly and hateful if they had not been white, you know, and I think I I will just say, recently there was this song, I want to say it was called Try That in a Small Town, and DJ Eric and Tool Time both did excellent videos talking about it. Actually, I suppose I could Let's see. Um. Hmm. Um. Okay, I will find the real, real quick, find the, the videos so that you can find, I could have sworn his name was Tool Time. Um, I'll find it later and put the links in the description box, but because I don't have anything to add to what they said, they did a great job just demolishing the, the narrative that it, the song is trying to... Yeah. Now, the music is handled by Howard Shore. Again, someone that has worked with Cronenberg elsewhere. And, yeah, like, there's some really suspenseful, tense stuff for the... Uh, actually, right, yes. The music really fits this small town where nothing happens and adding tension and complexity to that. And, uh, yeah, uh, there's 38 minutes of the soundtrack for free here on YouTube. You know, I, I would say it's worth listening to, you know, without also watching the movie. You know, as usual, I recommend you do also watch the movie. You know, they didn't make the, the music to make it, like just free for everyone, you know, they wanted it to support the movie. There's some really excellent sound design, some very, very nasty, you know, it's not quite as effects heavy or gore heavy as other Cronenberg, but there is some spectacular gore, and yeah, the sound design really helps sell. And, you know, as per usual, they go practical where it is not impractical to do so with the effect and the there is a little bit of like more modern you know I, I watched some behind the scenes and for some of it they did actually like use like green screen and, and such but there is a practical element even so now the movie is 88 minutes without credits and 92 with and like other Cronenberg movies, it is not, like, incredibly fast. It's not in a huge rush to, to go, you know. Let's see. The... Yeah, uh, the best elements of the film. It's a tie between how well it communicates its message, the acting, the... the the recreation of the of the western the worst aspect is the the child acting there you know Heidi Hayes and and one other kid and 
I've already spent enough time talking about it. You know, I, I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it ruins the movie. Now, uh, yeah, something I saw others, you know, some said that they something they really hated about the movie was it was too slow, not enough happens. And yeah, you know, I, I don't think that it wastes any time. I think it's just we need to look deeper. Now, the the first time I watched this, the thing I was most worried about was Cronenberg might mishandle something so different from his earlier career. And uh, yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. The thing I was most looking forward to was the Cronenberg touch, and the movie exceeded my expectations. Again, like you know, this this was the 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 second movie that Cronenberg made. The the first one being the 2002 movie Spider, that is incredibly different from his his earlier work you know before spider he made he made existence you know so yeah th this one brings back the gore that spider really had almost none of but it's not it's not like it doesn't have the sci-fi element that a lot of his earlier work had. I, I acknowledge not absolutely everything. Some of it didn't. But the the yeah, it's it's yes. Um the the trailer does give at least a little too much away. I think it was difficult to get audience interest without spoiling the the yeah, I already meant you know the the they didn't really know how to advertise it. Like the trailer makes it look much more suspenseful, intense, less intelligent than the final product, and than Cronenberg wanted. But you know, the trailer is fun. You know, just like if you watch it, don't expect the movie to to be quite the the same. You know, this was like when I first watched it. Like I had some idea that. Like, when I watched the trailer, it didn't really look like Cronenberg, typical Cronenberg. So I did kind of have a feeling that there's something else going on. And it's also, you know, Cronenberg is very difficult to, to it's difficult to make a, a trailer for one of his movies that isn't longer and slower than your average studio prefers trailers to be, you know. But... Yeah, you know, even the first time I watched it, I, I felt like there's got to be something else to it than, than that. And, uh, yeah, the, the cover and poster don't give too much away and do a decent job. Like, the, the um, yeah, so the, the poster, there's this, like, there's a, there's a gun out of focus in the foreground, and then you have Viggo Mortensen looking up at the guy with the gun, and Maria Bello behind him, so, and and like gathering storm clouds in the sky above, you know. So yeah, it's clear. You know, there's there's, it gets a lot across, and of of what the movie is like. Just again, it doesn't really get across the the depth, which is it is difficult for. For this kind of thing. Now, on right here on YouTube, there I've, when when I did the the search, I found five clips, one trailer, two TV spots, seven review analysis, one documentary, four reactions, and one joke slash pop culture one. Which, yeah, I I feel this deserves way more. Like, yes, I get you know, the movie's eighteen years old. It's not gonna have as much, but uh, the the. It's it's extremely relevant. If if anything, it's probably only yes, actually, not probably. I would argue this movie has only gotten more relevant. Like it is even more like you know, it, like in two thousand five, if you knew where to look, you could see this stuff. Today, like conservatives are screaming from the the roof tops the the you know oh we need to do violence we need to you know we have to crush the the invaders kind of just uh, yeah and 
and and that is also something I I realize I overanalyzed. So maybe the following, you know, I don't know if all of the user reviews I read were from Americans, but I got a sense that a number of them were Americans who did not want to think about that maybe the movie had a point about Amer America's relationship to violence. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a seven, uh, an 87 percent on the tomato meter based on 214 reviews only 27 of them were rotten and a 76 percent audience score based on over a quarter mil ratings the consensus a history of violence raises compelling and thoughtful questions about the nature of violence while representing a return to form for director david Cronenberg in one of his more unchar uncharacteristic pieces and yes yeah, so the audio the the average Critic score was 7.90 out of 10. The average user score was 3.7 out of 5. Anything above 3.5 is counted as an upvote. It's a it's a binary upvote or downvote. And yeah, the movie is certified fresh. On Metacritic, it has a an 81 out of 100 based on 37. Um, critic reviews it is rated a metacritic must see and the let's see yeah it's you know an 82 is universal acclaim of the of the 37 critic reviews there's only four that are mixed and let's see and one person says it's a hollow story from an empty graphic novel yeah, I, I think this person missed the the depth and um, okay another one says it's been calculated or miscalculated set up certain expectations fulfill them then do the same thing again thereby giving us a chance to see what's coming and at least in theory be shocked when it actually comes yeah see again I, I think they missed the the themes and yeah and and another yeah the next one also this um, it provides a few pleasures and a few giggles and Okay, this, yeah, this one, uh, Stanley Kaufman of the New Republic writes, the, the sort of investigation has been done so masterfully by Sam Peckinpah and the Wild Bunch, Oliver Stone, and natural-born killers. In a sternly utilitarian sense, we don't need Cronenberg. He's not, as far as I've seen, of a class. He proves it again in a history of violence. I think there might be some truth to that. Now... By the the user score is seven point four out of ten, eight, so yeah, generally favorable reviews. Eight hundred ninety four ratings, six hundred forty four of them are positive, ninety eight are mixed, one hundred fifty two are negative, and let's see, yeah, and it's yeah, this is where I found some of these. Um, yeah, just people who didn't really get it. Again, I'm not saying, like, you're allowed to, to dislike it, but the a lot of the people who disliked it, they don't, even if they did understand, you know, if, if they understood it, they didn't really, it, do, it doesn't come across in the written reviews they submitted. Now, the, um, yeah, so on IMDb, there are 1,230 user reviews, or 814, if you hide spoilers. I read the top voted 100, including spoiler ones, and so yeah, of the, of the top voted 100, Nine of them gave it a one, five gave it a two, six gave it a three, seven gave it a four, eleven gave it a five, three gave it a six, seven gave it a seven, twenty gave it eight, twelve gave it nine, and twenty-two gave it ten. So 
yeah, a lot of the votes there, a, a lot of the most popular reviews are the ones that really loved it. Now, there are 400... Holy crap, is that right? 448 links, and only 121 of them were in English and were not dead links. Wow. It's been a while since I did the research for this one. Um, anyway, the, the, the overall rating is 7.4 out of 10, based on 247,000 votes. 31.7 gave it an 8, which I think makes a lot of sense. 28% gave it 7, 12.5 gave it 9, 11.3 gave it 6, 7.6 .6 gave it 10, 4.2 gave it 5, 1.8 gave it 4, 1.3 gave it 1. So that really sounds like people who didn't really understand it. 1% gave it 3, 0.6% gave it 2. And... Yeah, it won 37 awards and was nominated 84, and let's see, I think this might be the one where, hold on, messed up my place in my notes here, let's see, okay, here we go, so it was, it was nominated for two Oscars. Um, let's see, yeah, the be best writing and William Hurt for his acting, but it didn't, yeah, it didn't win an Oscar, it won other awards for the various aspects of filmmaking, and So, yeah, the special effects, I've said most of what I have, but what I, something to, to add, you know, it's, it's quite bloody and very, very gruesome violence. You know, it's not like, it's not as much if you compare it to some of Cronenberg's early, you know, it's not The Fly, it's not Videodrome, but it definitely is... It's, it's quite gory for the film that it is on its surface. And there's some really great stunt work. And I have things to say about the, the sex scenes, but they're spoilers. So they will be in one of the spoiler sections. And yeah, um... I give this, I rate this 8 Explorations of Ethics in the Modern World out of 10. It absolutely holds up, and I hope that a lot of people go back and watch it today to really appreciate, you know, all it has to say. Like I said, it's only become more relevant. And, yeah, so the, the full ranking, including this movie... All the Cronenberg movies I've watched. Brood, Dead Zone, Naked Lunch, Eastern Promises, Scanner, Spider, History of Violence, Dangerous Method, Existence, Fly, and Videodrome. And yeah, that's it for the reviews. So from here on out, there be spoilers. And let's dive right into notes taken while watching. You get a really bad feeling from the two robbers the moment you see them. It just feels like there's something wrong. And then you see the younger one going into the motel, passing by the, the people that the older one killed, showing no surprise or discomfort at the dead bodies. And we see what the old guy meant by having some trouble with the maid. And then we see the young one kill a child in cold blood. See, like he doesn't even hesitate. Uh, the the kind of you know he almost seems like I don't know if gleeful is the word, but like he he jumps at the chance to shoot a child. You know, like he doesn't even like seem to consider. You know, maybe if I just tell her not to. You know, like he doesn't—he doesn't just threaten her. He doesn't just say, "You 
better not tell anyone what we look like or we'll come back or something you know that would still be awful to be clear but no he just like immediately like the only reason that he doesn't that that he doesn't uh, you know unholster the pistol even faster is because he doesn't want the quick movement to startle her you know he's he's that calm about shooting a child that he can think that uh, you know and you know yeah pretty good um Pretty good catch by Jack, and what a contrast between how polite he is at home and how the bully apparently thinks Jack he thinks he's some hero because of the game. And Jack manages to completely take the wind out of the bully's sails by not fighting back. You know, I'm not going to be repeating at least not the F slur, but yeah, you know, the the Bobby keeps you know using words to try to tear away at Jack, and Jack, you know, by the end just repeats, you know shouldn't that be chicken shit f slur piece of shit you know it's it's something like you know and and yeah it's like the the you know bobby can't like it just it completely takes the winds out of his sails he he thought that he could provoke jack let's see i i quite like that Jack is studying with Judy to Jack apparently means hanging out and smoking weed. I mean, maybe they did study earlier. I'm pretty sure his father would not approve of the weed. Although based on later in the movie, I suppose maybe he would just insist that he deserves a cut. What do you think people did for fun 100 years ago? Successfully auditioned for playing Kitty Pride only be recast twice in as many movies? very tense when the two robbers almost collide their car with the bully and the entire diner scene with the two robbers is very very tense I appreciate the detail that at first Tom is basically going along with them like he barely protests when they say they're gonna stay he freely offers up the money but when they threaten Charlotte he takes lethal action really messed up cheek of the older robber after he's shot in the face. I appreciate the movie acknowledging that sometimes it's not a clean, cool, visually appealing thing when someone is shot to death, as so many movies pretend it is. You know, in real life, you know, I've been fortunate enough to never see someone shot in real life. I've seen like pictures and such, but never like in in person. You know, but yeah. You know, pretty much anyone who has experienced it in real life will tell you that it is uh, yeah in the hospital literally every single channel is showing coverage of Tom killing the robbers and Tom is clearly uncomfortable and at first it seems like oh you know he's such a he's so polite and easygoing he just doesn't want all this attention you know but we later realize he knows that if this goes on you know someone might unearth Joey and when he goes home one reporter was at his house waiting to ambush him with questions just really underlines the American media obsession with violence and Carl Fogarty is a very intimidating presence from right away who's Joey you are Joey Cusack you know hilarious actress from Adam's Family Values Gross Point Blank Toy Stories or is that Toy Story Looney Tunes back in action. She's even good in Hoodwink too. Never mind. I'm thinking of Joan Cusack. Can you put me in contact with her? I'm not Joey. Joey says what? Mister, I'm not going to fall for that. Hi, mister, I'm not going to fall for that. I thought your name was Tom. Joey. Please leave. And the sheriff can't stop the violence like in many a western the movie does a really great job building the tension once Fogarty has been first introduced. He keeps stalking and intimidating various members of the Stoll family with an implied threat towards Sarah, direct threats towards the other three. But I really appreciate that he also keeps alluding to Joey. He's always talking about why he's doing it, and it does lead to Edie realizing there must be something to it, otherwise he would not be so determined. And the... Let's see. There was something else I wanted to say about 
Yeah, you know, basically, like, the, the black car is constantly right outside the diner, right outside the home, or just far enough away from the home that they can pick up, you know, like, Jack and, you know, Joey get into a fight, Joey slaps him, Jack runs away, and, like, two minutes later, the car drive pulls up, and they have Jack, you know, so obviously, they were very close by, just far enough away that they couldn't be seen close enough that they could, you know, and they were just waiting for someone to leave the house so they could, uh, yeah. I appreciate that Jack confronting Joey on multiple occasions. He's quite witty. He's genuinely funny. You know, the stuff about, you know, are you, if I talk to you about, if, if I talk to Sam about you, will you have me whacked? <laughs> Even use the right terminology and everything. And, you know, if I knock over the, the, you know, the, was it drugstore or something? And he even, you know, he doesn't just say the drugstore, he says Mrs. Wilkinson's store or something like that. Will you ground me if I don't give you a piece of the action? <laughs> like, that is legitimately, like, simultaneously funny. But also, like, kind of a good point. Like, he doesn't mean it completely literally, obviously, but, yeah, it's like, how do you expect me to behave like, you know, a, a good, a solid citizen when you're out here killing people? You know, you were killing people when you were my age, and you're telling me I can't get into a fight with the bully at school, you know? And I, I quite appreciate, you know, the, the fight, you know, with the bully... Yeah, like, the the parents might try to sue for assault. Which, you know, there's there's witnesses that can say, you know, yeah, they were like, you know, Bobby said some things, but he didn't lay a finger on him. You know, there's like a dozen witnesses. You know, some of them might, you know, lie for, for Jack. Not sure all of them will. I don't think he's that popular around school. And, you know, Jack tries to shut it down by saying, what? Mom won't take the kid, you know, the, the mother being a lawyer. And, yeah, you know, he and, and then we get to the point where he says, you know, how can you be telling me to behave when you've done so much worse? I appreciate the realism of each time Tom confronts at least two armed men who are really good at hurting people. He does get injured at least once each, dis uh, let's see, yeah, despite all the American movies that suggest that somehow any one person could possibly be fast enough to take out multiple people without being injured at least once. You know, if they, if they know what they're doing, if they're not, you know. And, uh, you know, several times blood sprays on him, which of course allows him to get into some purifying water by the the very end. Let's see. Yeah, and you know, after Fogarty is is dead, then you know Sam, the sheriff, shows up and wants to talk to, to Tom. And you know, he says, it doesn't fit. None of it fits. Now I know what he meant. But I couldn't help myself. Lubricant. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that Edie uses multiple different tactics to get rid of Sam. You know, at first, she, like, you know, she says, ah, oh, you have too much time on your hands. You know, like, you're, you're imagining things. Which, you know, for a number of people, that's gonna shut them down. If someone they trust says... You're just, you're seeing things that aren't there, you know, just, you know, and then she says, hasn't this family suffered enough? You know, so in addition, you know, she, she says he's seeing things. She says he's hurting the family. Don't you care about us? Kind of thing, you know, which again, a lot of people, you know, Sam tries to, to, to be like, okay, come on now. But there's a lot of people that that's going to work on. You know, she's being very manipulative. She's really pushing buttons there. And when none of that works, she starts crying and like, you know, buries her face by, you know, and, and like between the face and shoulder of Tom, you know, so like, you know, at that point, you're just a dick. If you stick around and say, okay, crying woman notwithstanding, I would still like to take her husband off in handcuffs 
because I think he's done something, you know, it's just, it makes you sound like a complete asshole. Even if, even though he is actually right. You know, factually. And, yeah, the, 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 I, I have more things to say about the conflict between Tom or Joey and Edie, but I have it in other notes. So I will move on to, you know, the, the marriage has taken a hit, and so at night when Richie calls, Tom goes, and I appreciate there's actually some tenderness between Richie and Joey, you know, the, like the they touch foreheads, the the you know Richie kisses Joey on the cheek and they they hug you know there's clearly you know like you can't even imagine Fogarty doing that to Tom you know Fogarty despised like hated with a passion Tom that's also it's, it's such a great like right before Fogarty dies you know he says you should have killed me back in or wait do you have any last words. And Tom says, I should have killed you back in Philly. That tells the audience, okay, there's definitely something going on. And there, clearly, he is actually, you know, yeah, it's not a case of mistaken identity. And, let's see. yeah, and so Richie talks about, you know, he doesn't want to get married. Now, in westerns, it doesn't necessarily make you bad to not want to get married. There's a lot of cowboys that don't. But he also doesn't care about Joey's wife. And that's, you know, why this helps convey he's he's the bad guy here. You know, he doesn't, like, he, he just says, can you really, can you imagine meeting a woman that would make you not want all the rest of the women of the world? And Joey says, yeah, I can. And, like, at this point, this is where Richie, if he wasn't a bastard, would be like, Oh, fuck, right, uh, your wife was threatened by Fogarty. Is she okay? Like, just, that that's the bare minimum. But he doesn't even, you know, he's just like, Oh, right, you are married. Oh, that's right. Which is a nice little, you know, so, so the audience gets, No, 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 it's not that he, no, he knows. He knows that Tom left behind his family to come here drove for 15 or 16 hours Richie's not even gonna ask are they okay cuz I know that you were attacked by armed men who want you and everyone you care about dead like just yeah cuz Fogarty's dead you know it's not like Fog if Fogarty was standing in the room I get Richie not saying you know oh, fuck that guy but you know he's he's dead you know, he even he he says how how that old prick could smell pig. I don't know. You know, so he's he's not above saying negative things about Fogarty. He's just not at all interested in the safety of Joey's family. And we never actually do learn why Joey attacked Fogarty. Certainly. Richie thinks it was completely out of hand, you know, and this is this is when Joey would defend himself, so maybe there's not a good defense, you know, he he says, you know, I'm just here to, to ask that you leave us alone, you know, basically, and, and he's not, you know, in general, he doesn't really, you know, Richie keeps trying to appeal to the old Joey, and, you know, it's, essentially he is talking to Tom, you know, Tom really doesn't want anything. To, to do with he's he seems kind of disgusted by you know like Richie's like didn't you fuck was it Jill Levy and you know Tom is like no I I didn't fuck Jill Levy you know just he really doesn't seem comfortable with it but but yeah I appreciate that we don't know because you know earlier you know Edie asked did you kill for money or pleasure and he said Joey did both so. Maybe he just felt like attacking Fogarty. You know, maybe he felt like digging out a guy's eye with barbed wire. Now, we get a lot of backstory here at the end, and it's told rather than shown. Now, this might seem counterintuitive. It's, you know, it's like, oh, that's first rule of screenwriting kind of thing. But it allows it to be all about the performances 
and how they, you know, the I, I forget, I think it might have been David Cronenberg on the commentary track, I forget, but, you know, some, um, it maybe it was an interview on the on the DVD, but yeah, someone pointed out, you know, Joey never fucked Jill Levy on the bar with everyone watching. That was probably Richie, you know. And the um, let's see. yeah, you know, we we actually never see. You know, every, everything that happens in the entire movie is present day. There's no flashbacks at all. And the, 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 um, ah, uh, let's see. Yeah, because of that, it is, you know, yeah, we never, we only, we, we see Joey temporarily take over Tom, but we never actually see the the kind of you know you don't get a flashback to a teenage Joey expertly killing people because it's not it's not about that it's about who he is today can he become a new person or is he you know cuz cuz like a, you know a lot of people would grant you know if you, if you make a mistake at you know as a teenager you you get to try to make up for it but can you make up for murder? Because he, like, killing for pleasure, which Tom specifically said to Edie that he did. Let's see. And... Yeah, and so after the final bloodbath, uh, Tom goes home, and, you know, I, I quite appreciate that, you know, at first, like, they don't, like, tell him this is no longer your home, get out of here, we don't want him, but, you know, he, he walks into the, the the dining room, and they're, like, there's tension there, clearly. But, uh, Sarah puts the, the plate at his, you know, and, and they had that out. You know, they were waiting for him to return, so that he could, you know, at least, you know, and the, apparently, the last two words of the screenplay are, there's hope. You know, and, Ah, let's see. I think I can't believe I'm already forgetting. But yeah, uh, Jack, I think like hands him some, you know, like passes some of the the food, and I think Edie like gives a meaningful look to him. I, f I forget the exact details, but but yeah, you know, all three of them show some gesture that the door is still open. You know, it's not like. It's not, yeah, there is hope, indeed. And I suppose whether or not having dinner with your family is a treat or a punishment depends on the individual. And that is it for this section. So that brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So, um, yeah, just some, I'm going to start with the, the comic. So, in, in, the, in the comic, we meet Tom and his family only right before the killing in the cafe, or dino. Tom doesn't, himself doesn't get injured at all. He kills one, the other surrenders, and, uh, let's see, the, and, and um, Fogarty, face is more messed up and he has a glass vial in a necklace around his neck of what appears to be Tom's missing finger which you know I can I, I don't think it would have fit in the movie the, the finger pun not intended I swear but I do appreciate you know that does make a stronger sort of like you know it's not quite DNA evidence but it's you know it's more than just, you know, this guy is certain he's seen this other guy. We do spend some time with the gangsters where Tom and Edie aren't present. I, I'm glad we don't in the movie. We only see them through the family and the sheriff. Uh, when the gangsters take Jack, or in the book Buzz, hostage, it's nighttime. Tom fires a shot from the house that, that detonates the propane tank right behind where, or behind where the gangsters are. Then Edie uses a gun to kill Fogarty, and only then does 
Tom get hurt. Afterwards, he explains his past to the family. He wasn't a hired killer. He was a small-time hoodlum who committed one really big robbery against gangsters as a teenager. He and his friend Richie, they're not brothers in the book, both kill a few. Tom only kills to steal, not for money or pleasure, as he admits to in the film. Uh, let's see. And for Richie, it was also revenge for Richie's brother, which I suppose might be why the Richie and Joey are brothers in the movie. Tom stole the money because otherwise his grandmother would not be able to afford life-saving surgery. He is a goddamn saint. How boring. We see him remove Fogarty's eye and lose the finger. His wife immediately forgives him, and the who is the man I married thing is resolved quickly and easily. There's no depth to her. And let's see. And... Um, right, and, and the... Um, yeah, in, in the movie, you know, he goes, like, he was probably, you know, he doesn't go armed, but he, you know, he, I can imagine on some level he was probably figuring on killing Richie. Certainly, like, he jumps, you know, he goes directly to that. He doesn't have to kill Richie, keep in mind. By the end of the movie, he's got Richie dead to rights. He could say... I don't ever want, you know, never ever send anyone after my family again under any circumstances, or I'll be back, or something. No, he shoots him. He shoots him in the head. Like, the, you know, I really appreciate that setup. There's no ambiguity. There's no, like, oh, he had no choice kind of thing. Let's see. But, but yeah, you know, in the, in the movie, he goes to resolve the, the, yeah. But, you know, in, in the book he goes because there's a police investigation. They want him there. She comes with him. He protests. There's a different gangster that discovered him. Cops say he should get a medal for killing gangsters as a teenager. Every cop in the book loves the vigilantism and the story. It doesn't really, you know, it's, it's not really an anti-cop story. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's no sign of the high school bully subplot, subplot. Buzz is only there to be a hostage. Like, you could write him out of the, the book and lose nothing. And, and I don't think they have a daughter at all. And, yeah, so Richie killed Lou, Lou Manzi Sr., but Lou Manzi Jr. is now in charge. Tom explicitly compares him to Caligula, so, again, making it completely, you know, obviously we hate this guy. Let's see. Uh, he wants to torture Tom. His man threatens him that if he doesn't go to Junior, they'll kill his family. Boy, that sure takes out the potential ethical issues of the ending. Also, the robbery they carried out as teenagers was all Richie's idea. Tom would not have agreed if not for him realizing Richie would do it alone get killed. They've kept Richie, Richie alive all these years, even though everyone thought he died at the hands of Fogarty. Junior says he'll hurt Tom's family, not only him. He slips and falls on his chainsaw, so Tom isn't even responsible for his death. Tom euthanizes Richie, the cops arrive, say a lot of people will be happy tonight, the junior is dead, the end. So, yeah, I'm in favor of all of these changes for the adaptation. Honestly, the book itself is basically the kind of story that the movie is satirizing. Honestly, like, knowing that it's the guy, or a guy, who wrote Judge Dredd, I feel like there's there's probably supposed to be something implied, but it really doesn't come across that much in in the book, uh, the the way that it does in the in the movie. You know, the the book was written, drawn, and adapted to the screen by Americans. Cronenberg, a Canadian, reworked the script and directed the film as a satire. He took the interesting aspects of the book, changed the ones that didn't serve the satire. You're of course completely entitled to prefer the comic and think it's amazing. Personally, I would go with Watchmen, which, like this movie, explores the violence that, rather than merely recreating it. I don't think it would make much of a difference to the media landscape if this did get a straight adaptation. It's already essentially like a Schwarzenegger movie, or uh, I suppose maybe closer to like a Van Damme movie, but, you know, with more guns and less splits. Like, it's... We have so many movies like that. I... I I think we need more satires of it. We need more criticism of the violence. Now, I think that might be... Right, so, uh, right, I copied in some stuff from Wikipedia. 
so yeah, uh, the film's title plays on multiple levels of meaning. Uh, Ebert stated Cronenberg refers to three possibilities. A suspect with a long history of violence, the historical use of violence as a means of settling disputes, and the innate violence of Darwinian evolution in which better adapted organisms replace those less able to cope. I'm a complete Darwinian, says Cronenberg, whose new films is in many ways about the survival of the fittest at all costs. Cronenberg himself described the film as a meditation on the human body's relationship to violence. And let's see, for me the first effect of human existence is the human body. I'm not an atheist, but for me to turn away from any aspect of the human body to me is a philosophy philosophical betrayal. There's a lot of art and religion whose sole purpose is to turn away from the human body. I feel in my art that my mandate is to not do that. So whether it's beautiful things, the sexuality part, or the violent part of the gooey part, it's just body fluids. It's when Elliot and Dead Ringer says, why are there no beauty contests for the insides of our own bodies? That really doesn't make any human... Uh, uh, it's a thought that really disturbs me. How can we be disgusted by our own bodies. It doesn't make any human sense. It makes some animal sense, but it doesn't make human sense. So I'm always discussing that in my movies, this movie in particular. I don't ever feel I've been exploited or in a crude, vulgar way or just doing it to get attention. It's always got a purpose, which I can be very articulate about. In this movie, we've got an audience that's definitely going to applaud these acts of violence, and they do that because it's set up that these acts are justifiable and almost heroic at times. But I'm saying, okay, if you can applaud that, can you applaud this? Because this is the result of that gunshot in the head. It's not nice. And even if the violence is justifiable, the consequences of the violence are exactly the same. The body does not know what was the morality of that act. So I'm asking the audience to see if they can contain the whole experience of this violent act instead of just the heroic slash dramatic one. I'm saying, here's the really nasty effects on these nasty guys, but still, the effects are very nasty. And that's the paradox and conundrum. Right, and, and IMDb Trivia, someone wrote, although Canadian director Cronenberg has repeatedly said Canada should have its own distinct culture and distinct society, for some reason, he set this movie in the United States of America. Yeah, because violence is a huge part of American culture. And let's see. And yes, so, uh, critic quote. We have two very contrasting sex scenes in this film. The first, a very loving moment between husband and wife, which provides some context later. The second sexual visit is unrelenting, violent, and caused a bit of a stir upon the film's release. Both perform in both scenes perfectly as a husband and wife, and they do so with chutzpah. Any actor that can carry out an explicit scene well, close to set or not, forever, forever has my respect and attention. Both displays in history of violence had something at the time of viewing I hadn't quite seen before in cinema. Certainly not in a mainstream movie, and hearing some shock whispers around me at the time of viewing, it appears I was not the only one. Let's see, and... Um, yeah, uh, let's see, yeah, Edie wanting to fix the problem, not knowing her husband in their teenage years, emerges from their ensuite in a cheerleader's outfit, coquettishly lifting the tiny skirt to show Tom some blazing white lace knickers. While Tom is still coming to terms with the outfit, Edie roughly rips his belt from his pants, pushes him on the bed, enjoying her sexual prowess and mom momentary domination. While she whispers, we have to be quiet, my parents will hear us, Tom has what can only be described as a very grateful look. She straddles him, they kiss, and he declares her a hottie. She is. Things heat up further as we see Tom lift her skirt, remove her underwear slowly, and perform oral sex on her. It's quite an erotic moment, her eyes half-closed, hands running through his hair. Quite soon, she's eager to please him back, and they both engage in the sexiest of numbers. They ex execute a 69 with finesse, and far from the blunders of teenage experience, which is likely similar to a naughty game of Tangle Twister. This first scene shows Tom overwhelmed by his wife's idea of role-playing and gives us an insight into their sexual relationship, which is so far gentle, respectful, loving, and dare I say it, 
a little boring. Our second sexual visit with the married pair is altogether different. Tom's violent past now revealed, and Edie, enraged by the revelation and the turmoil he has caused in her family, breaks from an embrace after a trying visit from the local sheriff. Tom in pursuit grabs Edie's arm, attempting to calm her down. She responds with an open palm, stinging slap across the face. She further angers him by exclaiming a poisonous, Fuck you, Joey, referring to his past criminal life. As she dashes up the stairs, Tom grabs her ankle, forcing her to fall. She hits him again quite hard, and Tom, or at this point Joey, pins her down on the staircase, hands around her throat, moving himself between her legs, restricting her from escape. There is a madness in his eyes, an intent to harm. For a split second, we think he will rape her. Edie's eyes widening in fear, giving credence to that notion. However, Tom emerges from the madness, removes his grip from Edie's throat, and has a look of disbelief on his face. As soon as the Joey persona drops, we see Edie then grab his head toward her and kisses him, no longer in fear of him. Tom slash Joey re responds in kind, greedily pawing at her, sharply pulling down her underwear without managing to take them off. A far cry from, this, from his gentle, deft mo movements when he was so loving with his cheerleader in our earlier scene. Edie is also grabbing at his belt, the urgency of their union is palpable. Shallow, short breaths are heard as he finally manages to penetrate her in this rather uncomfortable position on the staircase. They fuck each other furiously and without mercy, satisfying both their anger while enjoying that part of marriage that they're still in touch with. 30 or 35 violent thrusts later, yes I counted. All right, then. Our angry lovers are spent, kissing and softly caressing each other for the briefest of moments until Edie pushes Tom off her, a look of disgust on her face, and retreats alone up the stairs. I have heard too often this scene being described as rape. It has the potential to be just that, of course, before we watch the violent personality of Joey retreat, and he becomes Tom again. However, for me, it is a fascinating view into sex at its most ambiguous. How, after such a violent event, the only solace Edie could find was to furiously fuck and control that which she had completely lost, her husband Tom. It also deals with the notion of rape fantasy, how it is possible that the violence he showed instead might have been the driving force in her making that decision to pull Tom towards her and hopefully carry out what he originally intended. Regardless of the scene's actual intent, both Mortensen and Bello are explosive here. The chemistry between them is credible and it made for some very interesting viewing let's see right and um let's see one female critic said the sterile sex is not rape it is a non-verbal sexual expression of emotion he expresses that he wants to protect her grabbing her legs as she tries to leave leg as she tries to leave and she expresses first happiness for an attraction to that her kissing him, next the desire to get away from him, her running away, trying to figure out which of the two makes her feel safer. Making love to Tom, fucking Joey. Attraction to Tom, revulsion for Joey. The first sex scene was her pretending that he's always been a part of her life, giving him a happier past, strengthening the relationship. It's very telling that these two scenes are so different. Early on, stability. The stairwell, she's conflicted. And... Honestly, it's kind of wild how many straight male user reviews completely miss this. We straight cis men have got to get better at understanding female sexuality. I'm not claiming to be above this sort of thing. I legitimately do mean we all have to get better. Let's see. Right, and, and one critic pointed out about the ending. Um, or Actually, yeah, some of this is about the ending. Is Tom vi Tom's violence a carefully considered course of action or pure reaction? Will his killing of his brother mean that they won't be attacked by mobsters anymore or not? Let's see. And... Right, so this... this, this I'm not going to read this entire thing, just this one person who was like proudly saying that the, you know, okay, so they start by saying, what exactly was the purpose and intent behind this movie? And then they proudly proclaim that they weren't shocked by the way violence so easily invi invaded this nice little town full of nice people, or that behind closed doors Tom and Edie were violent with each other, like, Yeah. 
And yeah, and then they say, I'm all for scenes of nudity within movies. How long pay extra? But the completely inappropriate use of such scenes in this movie left me squirming. It's a Cronenberg movie. You're supposed to be squirming. But yeah, this is one of the people who did not understand the layers to the chair, the stairs scene. Let's see. Right, and, and this guy even admit, you know, others may argue the movie was showing deep psychological tensions between the couple, and then he just reject, you know, let's see. Yeah, he, he asserts without evidence that that's not the case. So, yeah, uh, that's that which is asserted without evidence can be rejected without evidence. I reject this claim. The entire movie is in conflict between the genres of mafia movie and western, the way that Tom is in conflict between himself and Joey. And... Let's, uh, right. Uh, one person said, I dislike seeing Maria Bello's hair down there. I wish she shaved. Okay, so I have two questions. Is she your partner? If she were, you can have a conversation with her, but it's not only your choice, it's also hers. If not, and I'm fairly certain the answer is no, fuck you. Huh. I guess I only had one question then. And... Yeah, uh, like all Best Cronenberg, it's about identity. It starts out with these two people who think they know each other, know their relationship, and changes genre and tone throughout. The incredible killing ability of Joey is a parody of Steven Seagal characters, and that's why the characters are Hollywood pretty instead of small town plain. And, uh, yeah, so one reviewer said, As a woman, I would definitely not stop trusting my husband of enough years to have a teenage with, even if I saw him engage in brutal violence. That is a fair point. I think it's one of many pieces of evidence that we really need more women involved with writing female characters instead of being so dude-heavy, bordering on it exclusively being males. Something that, thankfully, these days is getting better, but for decades, it really was only men writing women. And, you know, you can see a, a lot of the way, in a lot of these movies, it's very clear that negative, like, that when their female characters do or say bad things, it's really just these men working out their frustration with women instead of there being any kind of fairness, any, any kind of, they, they don't think about why women say or do things. And it, it, the following is fascinating. The only reason this is so popular with critics and the Academy is because they believe that no matter how bad you are, you can be reformed. Disgusting. Well, you say that, but then a different conservative said, the fact that Tom has put his evil past behind him shows how Christian the movie is. He has been reborn in Christ. You're both wrong. Like, the movie clearly... I... I the movie asks us to consider if Joey could possibly truly become Tom, if he could be reformed. It's not saying that they they actually believe just... God, conservatives have such terrible media analysis, media literacy. Anyway, um, and, and yeah, like, it's not, a, it's not a Christian movie. It's not... He's not reborn in Christ. Let's see. Right, and and one Chris, one person said, as a Christian, I found it too violent and sexual. Yeah, unlike the Bible. At least try to understand why instead of just rejecting it. Violence and sex in the media can comment on things, and does so here. Now, let's see. Uh, right, one person says Cronenberg's most mainstream movie. Um, Cronenberg has a gift for taking a normal, safe environment, turning it upon itself until it is virtually unrecognizable. Here he does that in a literal way. The man we think we know, the man Edie Stahl thought she married, turns out to be someone so different as to be almost a completely different species. This is not an easy adjustment to make, and some may find it too much for them. 
And if one person says the high school bully subplot is pointless, I completely disagree. It represents a smaller version, a microcosm, if you will, of the violence that Joey inflicts. It isn't fundamentally different. Clearly, Jack considers it self-defense, self-preservation, and he has a point when he confronts Tom, saying, at least I didn't shoot him. Like, the, mo the movie is explicitly saying, you know, the, the, the kind of violent vigilante fantasy that a lot of American conservatives are just like, they can't wait to get their gun off, you know. That's essentially like the the high school bully, you know, oh, I wish, you know, beating up the high school bully or shooting the, the you know, in both cases they're either slightly increasing or simply meeting, matching the violence of the other party. And one person says as a negative, the ending doesn't resolve the movie's plot and conflict. That's the point. We're supposed to ponder the questions the movie has set up by then. I, again, like, I don't know how you watch a Cronenberg movie and, and say as a criticism that the ending didn't resolve everything. Like, just... Yeah. And let's see. Right, so while in recent years he's moved on to more psychological fare, Cronenberg's latter day work still demonstrated keen fascination with corporal themes. Uh, history of violence, for instance, shows in unfettered detail the brutal consequences of a bullet at close range has on an assailant's face. The squirm inducing imagery, however, is a mere surface level shock. The film's real message is in its subtext that violence is a soul sucking family-destroying maelstrom that is not easily escaped. Let's see, and... If you're looking for recurring themes that run through Cronenberg's work, there are few. there are few regularly revisited than the idea of body modifications and how modern technology causes people to undergo physical changes that reflect either their true identities or the way they want the world to perceive them. And... There we go. Yeah, so, done with Critic. Oh, actually, hold on. There was that other... Yeah, so, there was that guy who said Vigo is very good in the role, but, uh, you know, yeah, he doesn't like how much Mortensen underplays his characters. Uh, you know, he, he felt that it, here, there was more to bring to the character if he just dialed up the energy a bit. But that's the thing, the, the, you know, at one point, Tom says, I didn't think I'd ever see Joey again. Do you think he just, do you think he literally just means, you know, oh, I flipped the switch? No, he's saying the part of me that likes killing or is willing to kill for money is still somewhere inside. And if I get angry maybe it'll come back to the surface you know that's the the whole point of his perf like just yeah i it's 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 frustrating to me when people refuse to engage with media like do you realize how blessed we are to have all this media that we can engage with like I, you know, sometimes I, I imagine, you know, what if I had been born like a hundred years earlier or something? Just, I would have been so excruciatingly bored. I, I would almost definitely be reading books constantly, and that would be great. But I love movies, movies and TV and streaming. There's so much to love, and and you have these people who watch it and they're just. They just describe it and act like a description explains why something is bad. And, and you know, it's one thing, like, it. the reason it bothers me is not that, you know, oh, I read this and it, you know, I don't personally agree with it, you know, whatever. I, I choose to read these. It bothers me that some people might only read one of these negative reviews and, you know, miss out on amazing media just because someone didn't want to engage with it at all. I, I, yes, I, I'm gonna move on. Well, obviously, statistically speak, right, so, now I'm done with critic quotes. Well, obviously, statistically speaking, very few people have actually been part of organized crime and then settled down, 
a lot of young men may have thoughts and opinions, some violent, sometimes even act on them, that they eventually hide from the woman they start dating. And, yeah, like, the, the, you know, I really appreciate that's such a big part. And that's, again, like, something I really, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad they changed from the graphic novel. The fact that here, like, she really does have a, you know, I, I acknowledge, you know, I, I just quoted a, a female a critic who said that, you know, that's not what she would have done in, in that situation at all. You know, so, so yeah, the writing could be better there. But I do appreciate that it acknowledges that the, you know, violence has an impact and... Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess maybe by you know, if you've been with the with a man for that long, if if you, if a straight woman has been with a, a straight man for that long, and they, you know, and she has had good experiences with him for all that time, I guess she wouldn't, you know. So maybe it's more if it comes up early in the relationship. But there's, like. I know a lot of men in person that I, I have no intention of doing so because I trust that they've changed. But like, I could tell their their female partner some things that would make them look differently at the the guy because I knew that guy when he was a teenager, and he was pretty fucked up. So, you know the the yeah. Let's see, and yeah, throughout the film, every act of violence leads to violence, and usually more extreme violence, and it's up to interpretation if it'll be true of the climax as well. Tom gets hurt each time he engages in violence. It's not the Hollywood safe vigilantism we're used to, and I just realized I wrote that twice in my notes. Whoops. I think it's noteworthy that almost every single act of violence that we see on screen is from someone we sympathize with and against an enemy of theirs. What little goes the other way is always in retaliation for the first kind of violence from someone we sympathize with and against an enemy of theirs. It isn't random, it's clearly targeted, and at least in the moment the character we sympathize with feels that it's necessary, proportional. No one accidentally hits someone who wasn't violent. Now, some violence isn't seen. Note that we don't see the little girl shot and does not fit into these two categories. We don't see, we only see the aftermath, we don't see the killing of the motel staff. Now, you know, so yeah, each individual viewer has to answer for themselves. If they can honest, if they even can, honestly, did they enjoy the violence? Did they feel the catharsis? This could easily have an innocent hurt. Maybe Jack or Sarah takes a bullet from Joey being careless. That would make it easy. Of course, that's wrong. But some would argue that none of the good guy inflicted violence in this movie is wrong, and they have a case, as just explained. And, yeah, you know, is Jack good at beating the bully because of genetics, the violence of his father, nurture, or a third option? And the movie depicts several of the good guy with gun scenarios that the American conservative dreams of. The father of a nuclear family and small business owner living the American dream stops bad guys who are going to rob him, rape a woman working for him. They trespass on his property. He's closing up and specifically, albeit politely, asks them to leave. And they specifically, not politely, refuse. And he stands his ground. Dangerous, gun-wielding men from the big city invade the peaceful small town where everyone knows each other, trusts their neighbors, and the cops are powerless. They know that Fogarty is a mobster. If you were any more of a black hat, he would literally be wearing a black hat. Like, everything else he wears is black already. He, you know, and, and that's again, like, I saw, I, I don't remember exactly, is, is it maybe, is it the abridged script... I'm going to real quick check, but I, I remember seeing someone say, oh, you know, the, what's it called, the, um, you know, the bad guys are wearing all black, as if it's, a, like, it's it's literally, yeah, yeah, um, the, the guys at the diner, the diner are dirty, unshaven, scowling, and wearing black, they are bad guys. That's from the abridged script. That's the point. The point, it, like, it is practically a cartoon, intentionally so. I mean, it's essentially making fun of this kind of violent fantasy. Now, let's see. 
Uh, yeah, you know, he keeps, Fogarty keeps following Tom and his family, but the way to stop him is for Tom and Jack to shoot him and his people. The climax has Joey easily take out his brother Richie and Richie's men, and if you face a bully at school, beat them. This movie asks us to really consider these situations. Essentially, some critical user reviews dislike the fact that the movie didn't present this revenge stuff the way they expected. You know, it's like if if every let's say that that every every shoe you've ever worn has had laces and you you think of it as just yeah, you know, whatever, you wear shoes, after a while you got to retie the the laces, you know. And then someone presents them with a shoe that has no laces, and instead of considering, you know, well, is there Velcro? Is it is it one of those shoes that shoes that you can just slip your foot into? They just hold up the shoe, screaming to high heaven, "Where are the laces?" Just like completely unwilling to consider that maybe there's a reason. Let's see. And yeah, Videodrome explored violence with a philosophy being more harmful than animalistic violence. This explores more animalistic violence. Now, there's a lot of violence in American culture. And to be clear, I'm not saying it's the only culture, but it is a very brazen and proud, you know, making countless movies and TV shows celebrating it. A lot of non-fiction US TV explores it in harsh detail to an extent that some of us other countries find very poor taste. And the movie is about American culture, and America continues to celebrate its violent past, so I'm going to detail some of that. I realize this sort of thing really pisses off American conservatives, but that's not the only reason I'm doing it, as I've just explained. America was created through invading the land of the Native Americans and killing, killing nearly all of them, statistically speaking. This massive genocide is celebrated on Thanksgiving, on which children are told it was a completely happy and mutually beneficial situation. After this, they rebelled against the British Empire. This, in and of itself, was not unreasonable, as the British Empire was committing violence against all of its colonies, but I do think it's worth noteworthy that they did not try to liberate the rest of the colonies, even though they were facing worse violence. They took notes from them, like with slavery. It would appear, and this is a theme for American violence, they only really consider it bad if it happens to them. If they're the ones doing it, it's alright. Now, part of that is the lizard brain and how part of the Bible speaks to the lizard brain. But yeah, you know, when they created the Constitution, they could easily have given equal rights to everyone on day one. They specifically chose to only give equal rights to all white men. Many have joked that they clearly didn't mean when they said all men are created equal. I think it's even more sinister than that. Like, they did not think that anyone other than white men, including white women, were human. I forget who said it, but it is an excellent quote. The founders signed the Constitution, you know, writing the, the you know, yeah, signed, a, signed the Constitution, which opens with, you know, all men are created equal, and then went home and raped their slaves. Now, you know, some people are, might get in the comments, so obviously we don't know for sure if they did that on that exact day. The point is they didn't make their slaves equal. Slavery was extremely brutal, including whipping, rape. Let's not forget, it used to be legal to beat your wife. Marital rape was legal. When it finally got to be too much, the South decided it would rather not be a part of America anymore than stop having slaves, and there was another war. An argument could be made that, historically speaking, America has just gone from one war to another throughout its existence. And as this movie very specifically examines, today a lot of conservatives have this revenge fantasy. They imagine they're going to be the hero of a Western. They're going to stop the bad guys who come into town. A lot of Westerns were defined by violence against Native Americans who were depicted in a very hateful, aggressive way to justify taking land from them. Keeping in mind, scalping was something Americans, not Native Americans, came up with. You know, Native Americans copied it. And, you know, that and that's something like... I, I don't remember. I was probably like 18 years old before I learned, no, 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 that wasn't a Native American thing. They did it, sure, but it was Americans fighting Native Americans who started it, and then the Native Americans also started doing it when, like, to, to this day, you have American conservatives saying, of course, we, you know, early invaders, settlers, invaders, had to kill the the Native Americans, they were scalping people. Now, let's 
and you know similarly black people have been labeled as inherently violent lazy stupid rapists which is eminently true of slavers but not slaves women have been labeled as inherently illogical all these things to justify continued violence against them a lot of action movies in america in general are about how the threat comes from outside americans are the ones to stop it there's a reluctance to accept that americans might have done anything wrong where this film toys with that idea after all Joey does put his family at more risk by lying to them about his past. But then, of course, that also raises the question, would it have been better to tell them? Would that have invited violence into their lives sooner? You know, and, and you know, certainly it's possible that that would also have been bad. But he didn't have to get married. You know, he was killing for money. He could have made a living doing that for the rest of his life. He chose to marry a woman and have two kids with her and yeah you know it's the 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 fact that it's just the chickens coming home to roost i think is is perfect and that was one of the interesting things that the the book the graphic novel set up that was thankfully you know also in this movie like america tom is currently enjoying better conditions than many others and it is built on the false image of being a peaceful loving individual hiding and denying the violence of his past without which, perhaps, he himself would have perished to the violence of others. He specifically admits to Edie that Joey both enjoyed and gained money from killing. But that's in his past. That's not who he is now, despite the fact that he has recently been killing people. You know, note that this is not before he's killing people again. This is after, you know, he, he just insists, no, no, that was, that was in the past. Let's see, and, you know, yeah, he has recently been killing people, for gain, his, his life, the lives of those close, close to him. Today, America is one of the most violent countries. Their gun deaths are hugely outnumbering other countries. Military spending every so often spilling over into wars, even though there hasn't been a just war that they've been involved with since Korea. I realize that the following may not have been true when this movie came out, but that really just makes it prophetic. Polls today demonstrate 60% of conservatives in America believe it is time for violence. There's many of them calling for another civil war. You know, like ideally in a democratic country, you'd want to be talking about actual problems. In America, and I realized also others, conservatives are screaming about how the other side is leading to brutal violence, even deaths, and has to be stopped. You know, there, like years ago, you'd have to look harder, but today, there's so many conservative politicians and mouthpieces who like literally say you know they'll they'll indicate a specific group like trans people and specifically let's see what was the i forget what his name was um let's see i know i remember the the quote so i'm going to real quick google it and find so the name of the guy fuck me there it is okay why does google put up like i specifically i'm looking for a name and it's like oh a speaker at the, here we go michael knowles at cpac said that you know trans ideology has to be eradicated from public life entirely the whole preposterous ideology at every level you know this is like this is literally genocidal rhetoric you know and he's far from the only one now in the road we see Viggo Mortensen's very tender gentle protective of his loved ones like he'll sometimes engage in violence but not like not happily and not necessarily all that well in the lord of the rings trilogy there's a certain darkness to him violence in him a sense that he's willing to go as far as necessary to make things right in this movie he does both of those and manages to make it feel like it's all the same person at the core and let's see Ah, uh, crap. I forget. Yeah, I didn't. I neglected to note. I think this might have been 
Maria Bello, who said in an interview, We never truly know ourselves. It's a continuing process. Can you go from a history of violence to a history without violence? Can you become a different person? And this movie actually ho helped to inspire the excellent movie Logan, some of Hugh Jackman's best work. So a couple of notes from the commentary track, uh, David Cronenberg on... So, yeah, he points out, you know, after the attack on the diner, the diner is full of customers, people who want to rub up against what Tom Stoll did. And he says, they, we only got one take where Fogarty is distracted by doing crossword puzzles, showing disrespect to the sheriff in a way that the sheriff can't legally do anything about. It shows how invulnerable Fogarty feels. And, uh, yeah, he points out, you know, the sheriff at the stall home comfortably sits on the couch. You get the sense he's known Edie since she was a little girl. He's been to our house many times. And, uh, yeah, when when Tom runs after Fogarty, and as Fogarty is driving off, you know, Tom briefly gets a very Joey look on his face. And... Let's see. Yeah, and you know, since it's a modern western, they go to the mall instead of the saloon or general store. It's not quite clear why Tommy is so obsessed with bullying Jack, but some bullies do have favorite victims to pick on. And the bully zeroes in on the sore spot that his, you know, Tom is a hero. He wouldn't stand for provocation. He's a celebrity. Jack isn't. And in the earlier scene, we saw Jack was like a politician talking his way out of the situation. On equal footing, Jack probably wouldn't win a fight against Tommy, at least not so easily, but it's the rage and the surprise which appears to be what allowed Tom to win in the diner as well. Uh, you know, keep in mind, the, the um, uh, Stephen McCaddy character pointed a gun directly at Tom before Tom is able to, you know, because Tom has seemed, by the, you know, to this robber, by his standards, weak, he takes his eye off him, you know, even though he's close enough, you know, he is within coffee's, you know, can smashing range. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, sometimes the people who hurt you the most are the ones closest to you. That's because they're in melee range. And, uh, yeah, when the mobsters confront Tom at his house, it's a very classic Western setup, the man protecting his homestead, the shotgun, and his wife by his side. When we filmed the bad guy half of the scene, there was a lot of sunlight, but then the next day when we filmed the other side, there wasn't a lot of light, which made it more complicated. And the violence... Let's see... Yeah, and when yeah, when Tom sends Jack into the house, he's no longer Tom, he's Joey. It's two guys from Philly, two mobsters. When Jack shoots Fogarty, at first it's cathartic, but afterwards, for both Jack and the audience, we're left with the aftermath. Jack is now a person who has killed someone. That changes you forever, there's no escaping that. The scene with Edie in the hospital room, and, and Tom in the hospital room, is one of the most difficult to get right, because it's just two people in a room, it's much harder than complex special effects, which you can hide behind its naked. He also, apparently, like originally, there wasn't supposed to be a bathroom, and I forget, it might have been Maria Bello, who was like, I feel like I would throw up in this situation, you know, and so the the poor, um, I'll, I'll have her name momentarily, the, um, the set designer had to you know, go out and and find, uh, you know, a toilet and a sink that could, you know, let's see, yeah, Carol Spear, who has also worked with, you know, Cronenberg. That's also maybe the fact that they've been working together for a while helps, you know, you don't want, like, the first day you meet someone to be like, Hey, I know you've been working very hard already, but could you make like a last minute kind of, you know, just, yeah. The violence is very messy. It's like a street fight. It's not balletic. It's not pretty. And and that's well worth noting, you know, 2000, like, this was around the same time that like, you know, this was, uh, this was, let's see. Yes, yeah, so this movie came out two years after the Matrix sequels, which, you know, I have some issues with, I'm not going to get into here, 
but the uh, what's it called? You know, certainly the violence in those was very, very balletic, and you know, this came out just two years after Paycheck, and in general, you know, the the um, John Woo had made several movies in in Hollywood that were considered you know that yeah were widely beloved and and I do you know I don't love paycheck but you know yeah some of his work I absolutely I I I think face off holds up really well for example you know so it it was extremely relevant I let's see I don't watch that many violent movies that come out these days most of the movies I watch these days are like based on comic books not very many of those have like R ratings and such so I actually don't know um, yeah, I mean, I guess today it would be like John Wick. Yeah, I, I hear those are, you know, they're, they're pretty brutally violent, but we're meant to get a kick out of violence, so. But, but yeah, you know, when this movie came out, it was really, it was the exact right time to, to criticize the, uh, yeah. Let's see, and, and, you know, if he wanted to, Cronenberg could easily make something that was, aesthetically pleasing when it comes to violence uh, right and yeah and the yeah after the second time in the hospital Jack is trying to figure out what his relationship with his father is realizing he doesn't really know him and right and originally the scene on the stairs ended with a slap and fuck you Joey I can't even imagine like it's such an important scene but Cronenberg went to the screenwriter said that can be the end of the scene, and in fact, it's just the beginning. You know, just, yeah, like, a, um, and, and actually, if I recall, I th yes, I, I think the, the, in the, in the, somewhere on the DVD, Cronenberg says, originally, there were no sex scenes. It was only violence. You know, there was also more violence, but he talked to the screenwriter and said, you know, I want you to add two sex scenes, one before the violence and one after. And, right, and, and Cronenberg points out it's not a rape scene. People who are inattentive might read it that way, but it's a much more complex theme thing. Edie feels conflicted about enjoying fucking this guy she just met afterwards. And, you know, and, and afterwards is like scenes from a marriage, but with the, the twist that he's committed violence. You know, and and it really it like when when you know she gets out of the shower and like he's sitting there on the bed and it's like you know he wants to talk and she just walks but you know she she notices him, but she doesn't want to talk. She's not ready to talk, so she just walks on. You know, yeah, like that's a lot of that's happened a lot in in many many relationships. You know, but here there's the the added detail that it's you know the reason she doesn't want to talk to him is because he's a killer. And when Tom drives towards Philly, you see shift in body language. His accent becomes Philly. And, this is, and, and he pointed out, I hadn't even thought about this, but Cronenberg pointed out, the French viewers at Cannes, where it premiered, did not pick up the, the accent, uh, you know, which a lot of Americans picked up the, the change between, you know, the small town accent and then Philly accent, and he does a really great job, and and so does uh, William Hurt, who you know I've heard him with very different accents. We actually don't know exactly what Tom or Joey is going to do near the end. Uh, Cronenberg changed the mobsters from Italian to Irish. It didn't feel Ed Harris and William Hurt made for convincing Italians. And because they're brothers, they're sibling rivalry, Cain and Abel, between Joey and Richie. Richie decides to kill Joey because it becomes clear Joey does not want to come back, won't become a lieutenant. But like many older brothers, he underestimates his baby brother. Cronenberg wanted to imply that the gangsters at Richie's place might be in gay relationships, which might be part of why Richie, Richie never got married. We didn't use suspenseful music near the end because Richie kept making the audience laugh. He is a genuinely funny character. Like a klutz, he gets locked out of his own apartment, which, like, doesn't make him look, you know, and that's, like, 
A lot of people have accidentally done that, but that's like doesn't make you look like a really intimidating mob boss. And Joey has the toughness of a gangster, but suppressed it for years, and is doing it again. And now he throws away the gun, rinses his face in the water, purification, washing away the sins of Joey. And uh, right, and and um, and Harris and Hugo Mortensen had worked out their common past. It was never going to be depicted on screen, but it meant that the two of them could use it in their performances, especially in scenes they share with each other. So you know, after Tom first encounters Fogarty, every single scene where they're like scared of Fogarty, yeah, he's you know Mortensen is like, you know, thinking, uh, God damn it, when I ripped his eye out with, with barbed wire, I should have finished the dog, you know, kind of thing, so that's, that's a great, you know, and, and he's like thinking of, you know, he knows what, you know, Fogarty does to people in Philly, kind of thing, you know, and, uh, right, and, and Maria Bello said, you know, at first the script seemed to me like it was just giving me a character who's a woman supporting her husband, but then I realized, in some ways, she's more of a man than Tom is, and when Joey resurfaces, she gets gets pushed into becoming more feminine again. That transformation fascinated me. And that's it for this video. So hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite Cronenberg movie. What is your favorite Morton, Viggo Mortensen performance? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel. One or more links to stuff like around my playlist. I suggest a video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out a vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. One video talking about a Star Wars thing of some kind. And, you know, usually, these days, usually animated. As soon as Ahsoka, which I believe is next week, as soon as that hits Disney+, Plus, I'm going to do a video on each episode as soon as I can. I do a weekly episode talking, uh, a weekly vlog talking about the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of The Bear, one for Scream Queens, and a daily video where I talk about a couple of episodes of the animated 90s X Men show. I intend to very soon do the, there's this nine minute animated segment of the, um, holiday, the Star Wars holiday special, called The Story of the Faithful Wookiee. I intend to do that before the week is out, but it might not be, might not be until, like, Sunday. And, yeah, uh, recently we've been thoughts videos talking about very similar to this one. In other words, if you're more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back channels, which catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching the recording. I'll catch you next time. And I do also intend to... I, I intend to do at least one more movie before this week is out. No details yet. Don't want to jinx it. And, yeah. Catch you next time.